What's up, everybody? This is Chris Nichols, and you're listening to an episode of the Nichols and Dimes Show featuring Jasmine Nicole. Enjoy. What's going on, Jasmine? Hey, Chris. I'm having a great day. How about you? <laughs> oh, it was a beautiful day. Thanks so much for having me over. I'm excited to do this podcast with you. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be a part of it. Yeah, well, you're up to some really cool things. And uh, let me just give a quick intro to everybody on some of the stuff you've been working on. But guys, I'm here today with my friend Jasmine Nicole, who's a talented singer, actress, model, and personal trainer. Her most popular song is Kiss and Tell with Sam James, which has a million plays on Spotify. She has also starred in several musicals. With Jasmine's passion for fitness and wellness, she not only trains clients in the gym, but also runs an assisted stretching and massage business, which started in 2020. Jasmine is originally from Fenville, Michigan, and currently is based out of San Diego and LA. So, (laughs) we got some stuff to cover, don't we? Yeah. What a life it's been. So you and I met a few years ago in the workout class you used to do, right? Yeah. It, yeah. It used to be Shock Fitness. Now it's uh, changed owners, changed names. And Ocean Pacific. Ocean Pacific. Yep. Yeah. We've got a we've got a great community and a few others on this podcast who who go to that gym as well. Awesome. But yeah, I'm I'm so glad we reconnected. You, you've got so much going on, and I was thinking about how I was going to focus what we would talk about. I really would like to get to know you inside because I think there's so much that you have going on that people can see on the outside, right? With the performing you're doing, with the music, with the modeling. And I wanna understand what your motivation is, you know, what you think your purpose is in life, in the world. And, you know, of course we can separate some of the uh, passion you have for entertainment versus fitness because you, of course, do your personal training and and the massage stuff you do have a powerful energy about you and i'm excited to get to know you better thank you (laughs) so yeah so maybe we should start with how you grew up because fenville is a pretty small town in michigan isn't it oh it's a speck on the map i think where i grew up specifically a little over 1200 people were part of that town the population yeah wow (laughs) it's very small we had one stoplight in the center of our little downtown area. Really? Yeah. Wow. Okay. So, and tell me about your family. Like, how big was your family? You had a few siblings, didn't you? Oh yeah, I'm the oldest of ten, actually. Um, ten. Same parents, and they're still happily married and in love. And so, uh, yeah, I'm the oldest, and I grew up with five brothers that were younger than me. Uh huh. Um, and then my mom had four girls at the end, but I pretty much just grew up with the boys because by the time my sister was born I think I was 13 and I moved out when I was 17 so she was still just like a toddler you know Mm -hmm. uh but yeah so we grew up on 70 acres um and just you guys have farms so not necessarily well we did have goats and chickens we didn't have um like cows and all the other animals Uh um but the the fun thing about it was that my dad was real both my parents were very athletic and into sports okay and so they made our property into a sports haven like really yes we had a full soccer field okay that sounds Um, sick (laughs) yeah we had a basketball court baseball diamond we had a sand volleyball baseball diamond yeah was it like a full size i mean uh no we not i mean it didn't have like the no not exactly but i mean we had um a, a lady who actually played softball in college that was on our property and so she taught us and we all played and Uh um yeah and then we had yeah like i said a volleyball court we had i mean we had everything like anything that was like that we were actually all homeschooled too right so what was fun about it was that my parents sold little plots of land to their best friends so Mm. everybody had like a couple acres and then everyone had literally like nine kids and ten kids and seven kids so like just between like four families we had nearly 40 children on our property (laughs) you guys made up the whole community yeah Yeah. so it was fun because we would obviously just like play sports every day together after school and then on fridays we would do a friday school where all the parents would actually teach a different subject and we would go house to house with Mm -hmm. all of our friends and we would learn you know various things i mean the boys we all would learn like mechanics and then sewing and then we did science products my mom taught spanish we learned sign language we had choir we did pe it was very fun so, so. this is all all that your parents did all this or yeah. what kind of help did they get to teach all the different subjects 
well, all the parents, just all, every, all, all the parents, the parents just like all taught in. different. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. as far as the community, my parents really cultivated that with like who they chose to really like you know be a part of. It was cool. It yeah. was it was a really interesting, different way of growing up. But I enjoyed it. <laughs> so, did you know how different it was when you were growing up like that? Did you have a chance to travel and see other places when you were a kid? I did come to San Diego a lot because I was born here. Okay. Um, my mom is originally born and raised in San Diego, so she had her entire family here. So we came here often. Like, we would mm -hmm. come a few times a year. So obviously I got to see, you know, what San Diego was all about and yeah. that there was a, a lot bigger world out there than I had seen. <laughs> you know, I can relate to that a lot, actually, because I was born in San Diego as well oh, and okay. moved to Hawaii when I was really, really young. I was not even two years old. Same. And, yeah, yeah. Really? I was under two when we moved to nice. Michigan. Yeah. Okay. Well, obviously, where you grew up is is unique place. Hawaii is also a unique place, very different from the rest of the U.S. at least, or, oh, yeah. or a lot many parts of it. And I also would come here every year to see family out in Coronado. So, I I can somewhat relate to to that limited exposure of something very different to the community that you grew up in. Right. Yeah, that's cool. So, wow. So you're. Your whole family and all your brothers, did they also join you on the and all the travels out here? Yeah, they did. Up? We all came here as a family like multiple times per year, pretty much our whole lives. Mm -hmm. So we'd all been on a plane multiple times okay. and all of that. But we didn't go a lot of other places other than here because this is where her family was. And the, my dad's family was already in Michigan. So Got it. Okay. Yeah. So was there a time when you were young that hit you like, hey, I want to be in a place with more going on. I want to not live in a small town forever. Always. <laughs> really? Yeah, since I was very young. I just, I always felt like I had so much more life to live than in my tiny little town. Like it just, yeah, I don't know. I was always a dreamer. I was always, I had a very large imagination. Even just reading books. I mean, I would just get wild ideas of the places I wanted to go and the people I wanted to meet and the mm -hmm. things I wanted to see. and. Uh, I mean geography and like just all the stories of, of the world it's like my I had such a desire to travel even as a child like my mom will tell you I can't wait to go to Europe and see the like I would always talk wow. about it so yeah I always had big eyes for a big world you know that's and, cool yeah yeah it's like I, I remember first time I went to New York City I think I was like 11 years old that was a, like a transformative experience for me in the same sense where I said, okay, this is my speed. This is my kind of energy that matches with me, which was so different from where I grew up. So, yeah, yeah I, I can see that. But that's interesting that it, it came at such a young age for you and that you had that awareness of, of how, how much you wanted to spread your wings. Yeah, it was always in me. <laughs> was, there, was there like a sense of uh, competitive, uh, competition, uh, maybe competitiveness is the right word, in you uh, at all that made you want to go and and be and be great at something yeah was, I mean that was also inborn I'll just say like I've always been competitive also growing up with five brothers like yeah. always just trying to keep up with them and <laughs> uh, keep up with the guys and play with them the sports and everything I was always trying to you know like keep up with them yeah um, even though they were younger they were men you know and yeah. very like early on they surpassed me in height and weight and size and everything right. um, but yeah, no, also just my character in general, like my personality, mm -hmm. I'm very much of a driven go-getter and um, just since I was very young, always wanted to be number one. You know, yeah. I am a firstborn and mm -hmm. so that <laughs> plays somewhat into sure. it, but yeah. um, I was always competitive in school and, and everything and anything that I was involved in, I wanted to be first. I wanted to like just, yeah, be the best at it. Yeah. yeah. How, so how about sports? What sports did you play seriously growing up? Well, so unfortunately, because we were homeschooled, I wasn't able to be a part of like a public school type mm -hmm. of um, competitive sport. Mm -hmm. However, uh, we did have <laughs> this homeschool track and field day that we would do every year with all the homeschoolers and all oh, the nice. surrounding areas of Michigan. So um, in like not in my little town, we actually did it in like a bigger city in Michigan. Yeah. Um, and so once a year, we would I would get to like get all that competitiveness out. And I did win every race I ever really I ever raced. Yeah, every I, ever, I got first place every year my whole life until I graduated, wow. <laughs> which that's not saying much. It wasn't that large of a community, but I was pretty fast. I think yeah. um, had I been in school, I would have been a sprinter. I would have probably done hurt. We, yeah, I don't know. I would have been in uh, track and field for, for sure. sure. Okay. Even like the. What was it? The long jump, I think I yeah. did. Um, whatever. They had all the little, all the things. And I, that was, uh, yeah, it came pretty naturally to me. So 
that was fun. But other yeah. than that, I mean, sports were just always like a part of my fun and social life, you know, uh-huh. with friends and family. Yeah. Okay, that's cool. And your parents, you said they were big athletes. Were they kind of all over the map as well, or did they specialize? They played in, in... high school. And my, my mom was actually um, a gymnast. Okay. And she competed at a national level. So she actually won state, uh, the California, what's it called? She won the bars, like, for the state championship in California when yeah. she was 12. And they wanted her to go into the Olympics oh, wow. and everything, but she just didn't have the drive for it. My mom was very much like, it was her hobby. It wasn't something that she wanted to, like, you yeah. know, blood, sweat, and tears over. So she... Yeah, she didn't continue, but so she was very much into that that side of things. I think she also played, I don't know what other sports, soccer and other ones. And then my dad played baseball. He uh-huh. played pretty much everything, too. Uh-huh. <laughs> I think he played hockey, too, because he was in Michigan. He grew up in Michigan. Yeah. Um, played a little bit of football, I know. So, yeah, kind of all over. Nice. So th- did you have an idea of, uh, throughout this lifestyle growing up, very active lifestyle, a lot of sports around, you had a bunch of brothers, Um, that you wanted to perhaps make fitness as a part of what you do in a career? I had no idea that I would ever make it into a career. Um, I always knew I was passionate about health and wellness and fitness because my parents were. My Uh, dad, they were both bodybuilders. Oh, really? And my mom also um, was an instructor. That's a big detail there. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, she she taught a bunch of classes, uh, like worked at the gym, you know, all up until, even when she was pregnant with me, she said she worked out and, and did class, like, instructed classes even when she was nine months pregnant all the way up until birth Uh so she was very active like throughout all her pregnancies um she was also a nutrition and health coach so i mean they were both so much into i remember as children we would work out as a family together i mean like oh wow as as soon as i could walk we would all do we we did the presidential challenge i think it is and i think it's the top two percent in in the world can do it or the top maybe it's the top 10 percent don't quote me on like the exact percentage uh-huh. i just remember it was like the elite <laughs> yeah. of like the regular people in the world and um we would all time our my mom would time us and we would do uh pull-ups sit-ups push-ups like in a timed you know see how many you can do in time and time it um we would do yeah group like as, as a family we, it was just very much ingrained to, into us since we were very young that's awesome so um, I always loved it, and then I just continued. I really have just done it my whole life. Yeah. Um, I didn't know I would ever make it into a career until it just made sense when people started asking me to train them. Mm. Just a bunch of friends, like, hey, Jazz, will you teach me? Hey, Jazz, can I yeah. work out with you? Hey, Jazz. And it just so much so that I was like, I can just do this and make some money. Yeah. How old were you when that started happening? Uh, it started as early as high school, honestly. Oh, really? Like, yeah, but because I started really training when I was, like, 17. Uh-huh. Um, so, like, I guess the last year, like, senior year, because I graduated high school at 17. I graduated a year early. Right. Okay. Um, and then after that, that's when I really got into the gym even more because I had more time. Yeah. And then, yeah, so I started getting asked. But I didn't obviously do any. I would just do it for free until later in life. And then, like, I guess mid-20s is more so when people – I did a, a bikini competition, and I did, you know, all that stuff. And mm-hmm. so then people were even more so, like, what did you do? Right. How did you do it? Yeah. Of course, yeah. So. You, you got something to show for it. Yeah. Cool. Okay, so then you went to Western Michigan, right? Yes. So – I'm curious what that transition was like coming from homeschool because it's a big difference. Yeah. You were homeschooled in a, in a unique setting, big property with a few families. You were friends of all the kids. What's, how big is Western Michigan undergrad? Oh, my God. Huge. Is I don't remember. I think 30,000, 40,000. Oh, really? It's a massive school. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so what was it like making that transition? Honestly, it, it was fun i was so excited i was like man i've been cooped up my whole life i'm ready to get out here (laughs) into the big world yeah Yeah. no i actually had so much fun i made a million friends i really connected with a a bunch of it yeah no it was so fun (laughs) i i actually really connected with the uh foreign community or the the community of like um all of the foreign exchange students yeah Mm -hmm. so i really gravitate towards other cultures other you know all that kind of stuff and so and learning from them so i made friends with all of them and then i actually in school this is so off topic but i would i i kind of created this little like community where we would all create um make dinner for each other once a week and each person would do their you know whatever their cultural food and so we would all try food from really all around the world it's really fun i'm mexican like Uh half mexican so i made mexican food someone else made you know chinese and korean and all the different ones and so that that was actually a really fun thing and then i also really connected with the sports community just because of how much i love sports yeah so i got to know all those teams and then 
Yeah, no, I was a very social butterfly yeah. in college, and it was an easy transition just because I think I, I naturally just make friends kind of wherever I go. Yeah, I also so. think you had a big advantage growing up with so many siblings. Yeah, like and we were never, like, not um, social either yeah. as kids. My mm -hmm. mom had us involved in everything. I mean, I was in, you know all kinds of lessons and different activities and our church was also a big part of our lives but had which had a lot of community and yeah and okay. all those kids went to public school so it's like i was around a lot of people all the time i never felt isolated or anything right yeah wow okay why do you think you were so drawn to the foreign and uh, international communities in college i think because i had such a desire to travel mm. and i really wanted to see the world and i just wanted to know so much about what's it like in your country what's it like in your world you know yeah. like I knew there was so much more than just what I had seen mm -hmm. and so I just feel like there's so much to learn from other people and that grew up differently yeah. you know in different cultures and societies I love that so you've always had this genuine curiosity about you and it's yes <laughs> it's, it makes a huge part of who you are it's why you're it's why it's why you have the energy that you do all right it's why people are attracted to be around you thank you so yeah <laughs> it's just well, what I'm putting together as you're talking here um, so that's awesome. I want to, what about music? When, as a kid, did this become a big thing for you? Well, that also started very young. Mm -hmm. um, I know that I have, I've seen uh, videos of the, like home recorded videos that my yeah. mom took of me when I was two years old. And I was like, mom, hear me sing this song. Mom, I want to sing for you yeah, this yeah. song. And just always, mom, listen to me and you know, so always performing and dancing and singing and that kind of thing and I actually had my first solo when I was two or three at church oh wow and okay. it was at over a thousand people <laughs> no way yes and my mom said I was not nervous one bit she's like you strutted up there in your gown you know it was a Christmas show yeah and they had a spotlight on me and I was just like <laughs> she said Jeez. I was like waving <laughs> like I thought it was big time no way <laughs> yeah and I think, I think, I think <laughs> you had it in you from the start yeah I did I was very much like <laughs> look at me you know I just yeah. love to perform and entertain and um yeah it's all over our home videos that like, you can tell who I was from like right away oh my goodness um, and then also like even with songwriting my yeah. mom said that she would um, as soon as I did learn how to write that I, she would find napkins like all over the house and little pieces of paper and, of lyrics that I had written and I would just oh. write little songs all the time and so it was kind of always in me all, all uh, uh, what was I gonna say <laughs> it was always in me um, as well right yeah Okay, well, did, did any of your siblings share this talent for music? All. All of them? All of them, yep. Every single one of us. Um, everyone plays an instrument. We all rap, sing, and write. Um, yep. Two of my brothers are producers. We have a band together called Friday School. And we have, yeah, five songs out on Spotify for that for our band as well. Okay. But it's just I, difficult to um, perform a lot together because they're all in Michigan and I'm here and I'm the lead singer. So it's I like... See. We have some music we're just putting out right now, but uh -huh. we performed, you know, in San Diego and LA when they were out here, but then they all moved back, so, mm. yeah. And it's it's actually about our childhood, how we grew up. Really? Yeah, because Friday school was kind of like our youth. Like, when we thought about it, like, what sums up our childhood? It was like, Friday school, that, yeah. was, that was kind of like the highlight of our week, you know? Wow. So, yeah. That's cool. Okay, so then once you got to college, and obviously you had your social life pretty, uh, it was a, it, it, there was a lot of energy around that, but what about keeping your music going? How did you keep that? What did you study in college, first of all? I actually studied organizational communications in Spanish. Okay. And Spanish was because, I mean, I'm half Mexican, and I have a lot of family that lives in Mexico, and I wanted to be able to get to know them and speak, their, speak yeah. the language. But also, I just wanted to know how to speak Spanish. You know, uh -huh. as a Mexican, like, I need to know how to speak sure. Spanish. Sure. Um, so that was one thing. But then the organization, organizational communications was because I wanted to start my own nonprofit organization. And I always had a big vision of what that would look like. I had a name for it since I was pretty young mm -hmm. and a vision of what that would look like. And it involved performing arts, but I still knew I needed to learn the business side. Yeah. So that's why I got that degree. Got it. Okay. Did you have any background learning Spanish with family growing up or not really because My mom, you're... like, knows Spanish. Yeah. She taught me very minimal Spanish. But because my dad's white, they just didn't really speak it in the house. I see. Yeah. And so, yeah. And no, because of the really. location you were in probably as well? Actually, no. There were a lot of Mexicans and around where we grew up. Yeah. We, I mean, Mexican stores, Mexican restaurants, yeah. a lot of Spanish-speaking people. But it's just not people that I was, like, you know, super close to. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. So... Yeah, that's interesting. And then how about the music? How did you balance that in your life to continue your 
your passion, your hobby, whatever you called it at the time for music when you were in college? In college, honestly, it was more so on pause. Like, as mm -hmm. much as I would still, I would write a song or I would, you know, but it wasn't really like the forefront of my mind. I was more so thinking about my nonprofit okay. and I wanted to travel as soon as I graduated, which I did. Okay. So after after I graduated, I actually did a one year, I backpacked all through Central and South America. Um, wow. and I And I just spoke my Spanish, you know, and that's how I was able to, and I did sing actually all over in those countries as really? well and performed, yeah. <laughs> so what was your game plan for doing this trip? Obviously, you wanted to work on your Spanish. Yeah, so it was an organization called The World Race. Uh -huh. Or actually, I think they're called Adventures and Missions, but they had this like program called The World Race, uh -huh. where you go to 11 countries for 11 months and stay in each country for a month. Okay. And this wow. was their first all American or all Latin American route they had ever done. So this was like we were the guinea pigs. But I said, oh, oh my God, I can learn. I can learn and teach. I mean, I can speak Spanish, you know, the whole year and yeah. really get good by the time I get back. So that was kind of my thing. And then who knew like what I would be doing when I went out there it was all social service. So we were mm. building homes and orphanages and working with children. I, I taught in you know uh, different villages where they didn't couldn't afford school and taught mm -hmm. them how to you know so music and and even speaking and um english all that kind of stuff so we did we did all types of things when i was out there but i was able to sing a lot um and we even set up stages and performed and put on wow. plays and skits and worked with children and all that kind of stuff how many people were involved in the group that you were traveling with my group was a little over 50. okay wow yeah and were were there other talented like uh, talented people in the arts as well that, that would perform with you um there were a couple people that did like miming and acting and skits and stuff but i was primarily like the one that was that would sing okay when we would like set up stages and stuff like that yeah but yeah there, there were a few others that uh -huh. did um yeah wow and so this group was it affiliated with a church or was it separate no, just no? uh an organization at the adventures with missions yeah that was that's amazing i'm sure gosh so you did it for a whole year after college? Yes, immediately after, I mean like weeks after graduation. <laughs> I think I graduated like end of December and it started like beginning of January, like after Christmas. Yeah, I had like two week break and then I was gone. And I couldn't even come home. Like their, their whole commitment is like, you leave for a year, you do not see your family or friends or go back or no one can visit you. You have to just fully give your life to this uh, for a year. Wow. So it was like, oh, my my la my, my mom's last, the 10th child, our, our baby yeah. was born when I was gone. I didn't even get to meet her until she was almost a year old. Oh, wow. That yeah, was wow. wild. Yeah. So I would just see pictures and videos, but yeah, it was, it was, a, it was a year. <laughs> what was the accommodation like? Was it comfortable? No. Or, no? Okay. We were in tents. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, there were times, uh, we did have um, a, a hostel here and there that we would get to stay in and that was like luxury and they were yeah. not nice hostels either. <laughs> but um, the, yeah, no, the, the tent situation was just the worst depending on the country because some of the countries depending on what time of year it was was so brutally hot yeah like uh nicaragua was by far the worst country mm. that i i mean the first worst experience i had they put us on this godforsaken plot of land with all these starving animals literally it was like a desert we had no running water okay Jeez. we legitimately were pumping water out of the ground into a bucket to bathe ourselves obviously <laughs> we had like soap and all that that we had bought at the store uh -huh. um but no like real running you know nothing like that i mean we didn't have a real bathroom nothing like it was we were out there wow. and then not to mention we were cooking on like some makeshift fire like it was we were really just yeah and then the weather was so bad and we had no shelter so like um i remember like sweating so bad that i would have to wear like a bandana that was wet you know uh -huh. um and then i had boils on my face like at some point like i actually because just it would start blistering after just like all the heat and yeah. my, my skin wasn't used to it so it was brutal like that wow. that month in particular was pretty brutal wow nicaragua nicaragua was like the worst so what were like the the some of the other hardest countries to spend the month in versus some of the nicest ones in the my in the favorite span. was panama okay um, because I got to travel so much throughout that country, most of the countries we would like stick in one location, serve, you know, in whatever way we were doing that, mm -hmm. and then we would move on. So we didn't get to travel a whole lot within the country, but Panama was the country where I got to go out and seek new connections for the organization to connect mm -hmm. with, you know, to serve. So it was like, I was going all over, and yeah. we were able to see so much of that country. It was absolutely beautiful. We hor we did horseback riding in the mountains in the middle of a <laughs> lightning storm, and it started really? like, yeah, I mean, 
mean, it was like being in a movie, you know, yeah, like, I and it was, say, and, like and I didn't, I've never ridden a horse like that. Like I had just trotted as a kid. And so my horse just took off full speed. I mean, I was like at a full gallop. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember the lady being like, did you like grow up riding? Like our instructor, I'm like, not at all. She goes, well, you look like you know what you're doing. I was like, I just held on for dear life, squeeze those thighs together. <laughs> I was like, yeah, so um, that was, it was a really fun experience. And actually I have an uncle, a great uncle or like a very distant uncle that lives out there that I was able to meet for the first time that is Panamanian. Oh, wow. Yep, and so that was super cool. I met him and his wife, and we got dinner. And wow. uh, yeah, so I mean, it, Panama was a great experience. But of course, there were other countries that were great as well. But uh -huh. it, it was all just there were hard moments and wonderful moments, and mostly the people that mm. were definitely like that touched my heart, you know. Yeah. And still, I keep in touch with some of them to this day. Really? Yep, on Facebook, and, and they follow. Cool. You know, we follow each other on Instagram, that kind of thing. Yeah. Wow. Okay, so when you started this trip. Yeah. It was one year. Mm -hmm. You did 12 countries, yeah. one month per country. Yeah. By the end of it, when you came home, how would you describe how you changed the most from this experience? Oh, man. Where does it begin? Honestly, in the beginning, I kind of had... Um, it, was a, it was a major shock, I mean, coming back to the States. And... The end of my trip didn't end so well for me. Like, mm. I had just a lot of experiences that weren't wonderful. So when I came back, I was kind of a little bit in a funk already, mm. like, before I even touched ground. Mm. And so um, it took a little while for me to get back into the groove of even, like, finding my my joy again, I guess yeah. you could say. But that, that's, like, a whole other story of, like, why that all happened. But mm. um, Is for it, another it, time, maybe. Oh, another time? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So... All right, so it sounds like there were some experiences on the trip that... They were pretty traumatic. I nearly died mm. several times. Oh, like, so I mean, I wouldn't mind sharing some of those, but I mean, some of... Yeah, <laughs> I guess wow. I could share. Um, well, up to the you. The thing is, is that it's going to get a little on the spiritual side, you know, if, mm -hmm. that, if that's okay. Of course. But yeah, <laughs> the biggest highlight for me was working with the orphans and working with the kids in the communities. To me, that lit up my fire of, of what I wanted to do for my nonprofit. I knew I wanted to work with kids, but being out there and being able to teach and being able to be with them, it was like that, that was what I loved out of that trip and yeah. just the people. Um, mm -hmm. But other than that, no, overall, it really was a pretty traumatic experience. I mm -hmm. almost, di I, yeah, I almost yeah. died several times. There were so many other countries too where we had, we did <laughs> hikes or landslides. The whole mountain started coming down on us. And what? like we were dodging like boulders. My friend got gashed and almost like we had to tie her leg up with a, oh, with a you know, like <laughs> we were like crawling down the mountain like, uh, like spiders, you know, like on our backs and barely made it out alive. Like we were like cut up with blood and <laughs> we had like dirt everywhere. And then one time we were in Guatemala I think that one was in Peru that that one happened. Uh -huh. And then we were in Guatemala and we were dry, we were on a chicken bus. Yeah. All of a sudden it starts smoking and they the, the guy starts spinning out of control, goes over the median on the freeway and starts heading towards oncoming traffic. He starts swerving out the like we barely get off the road. Everyone thinks it's going to explode. We all run off the run out of the bus, you know. But I mean it was like a crazy like we were like all thinking we were going to crash. Yeah. Um but yeah, we dumped out got dumped out on the side of the road. We had to walk 30 miles to the next to the next city like we we're in the middle of nowhere we had our big old backpacks yeah. we we're like we just wow. had so many crazy things and then um we were on this one bus called uh well it was like a double decker bus uh -huh. on death road in bolivia yeah and it's called death road because people die mm -hmm. like every week on yeah. this road i'm like why would you put me on this yeah. road I'm like what the heck this is so insane um i remember getting on that bus and people saying um, you know, three girls were sitting in those same chairs and they died last week. I was like, oh yeah, thanks a lot, buddy. Yeah, like, yeah. Oh, I really wanted <laughs> yeah. to know that. So I literally stayed, it was like a 15 to 18 hour bus ride, that one. Oh, and I wow. remember we were, it was in the middle of, um, of a uh, rainy season, uh -huh. right? So we're driving and it's like mud everywhere. We had to get out several times and literally haul it, haul the bus with like knee, the knee high and mud with ropes, right? Hmm. As we're trying to just get out of there. And then when he was driving, the bus driver would, li it's like a one way road with two way traffic. So you yeah. just have to kind of honk before you, and it was foggy. So you couldn't see more than a foot and a half in front of you. He'd be like, beep, beep, let's hope no one's around the corner. And we'd be like, ah, like hoping that we wouldn't get crashed into. And then there's 
there's no railing. Yeah. So you're right along the edge. There were times where he would skid and we drove over a, a running waterfall <laughs> and he would skid and start sliding and we would tilt and we would literally see the abyss of like where we could fall. Oh and then goodness. he would get back on the road. Then he'd swerve back. I mean, it was like, it was just so, life threatening. Yeah. The, wow. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, this, this trip, when, when you first told me about this trip, I had a, the, pretty much the opposite impression. <laughs> I was like trying to compare it to my little Europe trip where I went and had fun and after college no, and jumped around. No, it wasn't one of those. No, not quite. <laughs> yeah. So, but but I think one thing that's that I'm gathering from this is it, it and, and I'm, I'm sure you were, you know, you were very serious about your faith as, from childhood, right, growing yes. up. But I would imagine this experience of extreme testing, yes. right, in a spiritual warfare environment, mm -hmm. made you made you grow so much in your faith afterwards right like quite a bit afterwards yeah and in the heat of it i was like god where are you do mm. you even see me are you there you know like there during that deep like stuff that i went through in nicaragua specifically like all that just mind stuff i almost like lost my faith for a second you know yeah but then yeah once i came out of it then i was like all right, God, I ain't, it didn't kill me. It made me stronger, you know? Right. Like so, I, so. That's, that's what I'm wondering. Like, how right. long after the trip did that occur to Probably you? Probably six months. It was a oh. good while. Yeah, no, uh -huh. it was rough for me to even, like, I, I, I literally didn't talk to God for, like, probably three months. Mm. Like, I was so just dis I, I don't know I, I was just like I can't believe you didn't protect me like I didn't mm. feel protected you know wow. and I was like where were you Psalm 91 was always my favorite scripture I had it memorized I would speak it all the time and it's all about you are my shield you are my you know all yeah. all about him and I was like where were you like I, I could have like I don't even were you there you know uh -huh. like so I felt kind of abandoned mm. a little bit and um yeah it wasn't until quite a bit later that I yeah felt that Okay. There was a reason for it, you know. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay, so I, I'm trying to connect the dots from from that whole experience you had and yeah. recovering from that to you getting moving with your career and, and all the different things you've been working on. Yeah. And I, I guess so. When you came to San Diego, you got connected with Awaken. Yes. Uh, did you stay out here, or did did you? I pretty much moved out here. I felt really, I really felt something inside, like say to me, um, when I was at, you know when I was there visiting and I just heard say, put your roots down here. This is going to be your new family or mm -hmm. like, this is going to be your community, you know? And so that's what I did. No, I literally went home. I, I had a job lined up like right when I got back, mm -hmm. um, a job, a car, a place, like everything. And, and God was, I just really felt like just cancel it. And I'm going to set you up in San Diego. So wow. I moved out here in faith with nothing like really, I had my grandparents here, so I knew I could stay with them in the meantime. Uh -huh. Um, but as far as like a job or a call, anything else, it was like, I'm just going to figure it out. And I'm not kidding. I moved out here and it was like within one week, I had a better job than I ever would have had in Michigan. I had by someone who reached out to me on like LinkedIn or something. And it was like the perfect job. It was literally for organizational communications, exactly what my degree was in. I had a, a four, I mean, it was a great job. So I got that job. I had a car. I, I, I was able to buy a car, have a place all within a week. And then I was plugged into the community. So it was like, it literally all fell into the, into place immediately. So wow. I, I, if that wasn't a sign from God, I was like, okay, that's, yeah. that's my sign that I'm in the right place in the right time where I'm supposed to be, you know? Uh -huh. Yeah. That's incredible. Okay, so what was that first job you were doing, the type of work? It was actually working for an online database software company, uh -huh. but I was kind of the face of the company. I was the voice of the company. I did not only sales, but um, also like within the software, I was yeah. the voice, and I was the I was doing uh, walkthroughs and tutorials and um, the visuals and basically running like all the the human relations side of things yeah. within the company. Okay, and were you still? Uh, doing some personal did you get involved in any personal training fitness related stuff? I did stuff? like uh, here and there I would like train a friend but it wasn't necessarily like a main focus. I got it. Mind. Okay. Yeah. Wow. But it was in that experience of working at a desk you know mm -hmm. and working like every single day six to three or whatever like that I I realized like I just I wasn't fulfilled in that kind of, mm -hmm. an, of an atmosphere. Okay. I was like nope I have to be with people I have to be giving my, you know, and I was like, I'm not meant to be doing this kind of job. Like yeah. I have to be either performing or just like with people. So that's kind of when, um, I realized like I wasn't happy in that kind of a job. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That, and that's... then I was like, I need to run my own business. I need to do my own thing. Okay. Like I can't work for someone else. Cool. I can't do this whole clocking in and out thing. <laughs> I love it. Okay. That's, that's what I was looking for. Yeah. What you just said. And so how did you deal with it then when you had that realization? 
Well, actually, it was kind of lucky for me that the company ended up kind of going under. I mean, like, and so mm -hmm. everyone Lost just got lot laid off. Yeah. And so, I mean, it, during that period of just, um, I did get some unemployment because it was like out of the blue. Um, mm -hmm. Then uh, I was able to just kind of figure out like, well, what do I want to do now? You yeah. know, and then I was able to try certain things and I did start doing personal training and all of that. So. Okay. And wow. just diving into some of my passions. Yeah. Yeah. And then how did you incorporate, how did you balance out any music work you were doing at that time? Or, or were you yet? I was. I was actually going to L.A. and um, just, like, networking a lot. I was uh, like, I just need to meet the right producers that I want to work with. I want to meet other artists. I want to, you know, figure out what it's like over there. So I kind of know what to start doing. And then I just started writing a lot of music. That was kind of just the time that I was writing. Got it. And um, just working on writing. Because I didn't want to just be a singer. I wanted to be an artist. I yeah. wanted to find my voice, have something to say, and be able to write my own, out of you know, stories from my own life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Wow. And then this was probably like uh, a couple years or so before 2020, maybe if, when you were doing that software job. I guess that wouldn't make sense. Maybe a few years before, yes. so five years or so before, and then you were you were just working on this stuff. Like, what were you doing for most of your time after this job with the software company until the pandemic started? Aside um, from the personal training here and there, doing your songwriting, networking in LA. Like, what were you doing other stuff as well? Or was it just mostly working on building I did up? nannying a lot because uh -huh. I just love kids so much. I was like, that's a great way for me to kind of get my cup filled because my family was all in Michigan, so uh -huh. I missed being around kids. So I did a lot of nannying um, as well and kind of just ran my... I didn't go through any agency. I just set my rate, set my... You know what I mean? And yeah. I would just kind of do my own thing, and then I would just nanny for different families. Um, so I did that. I also served on the weekends and I was just mm -hmm. hustling like whatever way I could, you know, I did a lot of serving in high school and stuff like that. So yeah, that in college. So that was something that I was comfortable with and that I added to. Okay. So w when was it w where your music passion turned into an actual real career for you? W where did things turn around? Was there a moment that you can point to? Absolutely. I mean, um, I mean, when I moved to LA, I actually ran a small, um, God, what would you even call it? Like a pop-up venue. Uh huh. So I, I emceed, but the, and I also booked everybody, and I also basically was this, ran was the this night. nightlight. Yes. Okay. Cool. Yes. Yes, it was nightlight. So that was like a, it was very candle lit with like hanging lights and like an intimate, almost like a so far sounds or tiny desk concert type vibe. Uh -huh. And um, we would have, so I connected with like everyone in LA, you know, to get people and book artists and people that were big and small and all the in between and new people and old people. Um, and that was really fun. So I did that for like over a year. And that's when I really started getting involved in the industry. I yeah. met producers that I started working with and I started collabing and I started you know, getting involved in that world because I was like running a venue. Mm -hmm. um, so that is pretty much when I started performing anyways. And I had already been writing my own music, but I started mm -hmm. performing and um, connecting with other artists. But as far as like, um, and I would and I would get paid to do like different things, you know yeah. what I mean? And um, be featured and different people's things or they would ask me to demo something or whatever. And then I was in someone's music video and they flew me out and I was it was in a du I was in a duet. Uh -huh. um, and I was so I sang that as well. And yeah, so there were like little things that started happening when I was out in L.A. But then it wasn't really until Kiss and Tell yeah. um, that really put me on the map because as far as like, OK, and this is my more of my career now because I ended up getting signed mm -hmm. with Universal. Oh really? Um, for a, yeah, for a, an artist development agreement, um, and it was it was after that song was basically like they're like oh we want we want to yeah, work with you you of know, course. so then it became more of like all right now I have a team now I'm working with you know who I want to work with and and we're putting together a whole a whole bunch of music that we're uh -huh. about to put out this year. <laughs> yeah. So this is the year that we're finally going to be like releasing. I have three songs coming out in the next few months. Love it. So, yeah. Okay, so I, I want to ask about how did Kiss and Tell get produced? How did that come to life? How would you get connected with Sam to do that song? Yeah, that was a crazy story. So Taylor Hill is a very talented artist and producer that I met when I first moved out to LA. And then we ended up becoming roommates. We lived in this house with all these artists and producers and musicians. Mm -hmm. um, there was like six of us and it was like a six bedroom home. Um, anyway, so we got really close and as friends and then I started working with him. He's worked with 
everyone you can imagine. Aria, Ariana Grande and like the biggest names wow. you know in the game. So he works with everyone. Koi Ray, he just produced her, on her last album and the one before that, and just I don't know anyone you can think of yeah. that's big like he's worked with. So that was kind of crazy that he was like my close friend, you know, and I was able to work with him. And um, I forget where I, where what it was. I was just wondering time. how that song came together. Right, the right, song. Yeah. So mm -hmm. no, yeah. So Taylor and I started just like, oh, well, we would hang out and then we, oh, let's write a song together, like yeah. for fun. And that song just happened to be one of the we like the, we just did a session um, when I was living out there. This was a few years ago, mm -hmm. and we wrote that song and we thought, man, this one's special. This one is like is really catchy, you know. Yeah. And and then we showed it to some people. We showed it to Lady Gaga's producer at the time, oh, and wow. he was super impressed. And we showed it to. I mean, he's like, yeah, this is a hit, you know? And we had other people confirm, like, this is a hit song. This is a, yeah. this is a, you know, good one. Um, Wait, was this just just in written uh, format at the point? or No, I mean, I, we, I sang on it, he sang, sang on it, it as okay. a demo, you know? So we, yeah. like, had it all pretty much there. Um, it was bare, it was, uh, it wasn't bare bones, but I mean, it was, like, minimal instrumentation. We hadn't fully produced it out, but yeah. I mean, it was, like, the core of it was all there, right? The skeleton of it. Uh -huh. um, anyways, but it just kind of sat on the shelf for a few years, honestly. After we wrote it, we didn't really think, we thought, we thought neither one of us wanted to sing it. We're, like, we're sure that someone else would want it, like, some other artist. Yeah. And then Sam James comes along, and I guess his producer was friends with Taylor, Taylor mm. Hill. And so he was like, hey, man, let me play this track. And Sam loved it immediately, and he said he's never previously recorded anyone's song that wasn't something he had written himself. Wow. He said, this is the first song that I was like, I want to I want to cut this song. I need this song. I want this song. Get this song. That's you know? cool. And it was like an instant, instantaneous thing. He said that they played it for him over and over and over again. And yeah. so, yeah, he ended up uh, wanting to basically buy the song off of us, okay. which was cool. Yeah. And I didn't think I was going to be on the song, but then... Like, I don't know, not even a few weeks later, they reached out to me and and he said, hey, man, I've taken this song to all these different studios and labels and like and radio stations. And everyone keeps asking, who's the girl on the song? Yeah, because you're like, on the demo. I was on the demo. Wow, and he's like, and cool. you sounded so good. He's like, I don't want to take you off. the. I don't want to take you off. Like, who is this girl? Yeah. He's like, then we pulled up your Instagram and we're like, she's got the look. She's like, yes, yeah, we're gonna yeah, yeah. <laughs> let's have yeah. her be in the song. Wow. So that was how that happened. And then when they reached out, they said, hey, would you actually feature on the song and be in it? And we'll just keep you on the song. I'm like, yes. Uh -huh. So then Sam and I met in person. We hit it off immediately. It was okay. like a brother sister vibe. He was like the older brother I always wanted, you know? <laughs> um, and so we just were like yeah. total like bro sis vibes, which was so fun. We met up in LA and hung out the whole day, shot a bunch of content together, and it just was like, yeah, this is totally gonna work. Let's do this. That's amazing. And so that's kind of how that song came about, yeah. Wow. So you you said you didn't think you would be on the song because right. you, you were just- I wrote it thinking somewhat, like for someone for else. For someone else. You know? Yeah. Did you have, was it even in the back of your mind at all? Because you had this idea growing up, right? From you, you, when you were two years old, performing in front of a thousand people, and everyone knew, okay, it's just something special about Jasmine when it comes to performing. Uh, and, and I'm sure you had it in you, like, hey, you know, one day I'd, I'd love to be a star, right? Yeah. I'm sure you always had that that dream within you. Did you ever think, even with this song, oh, well, you know, if they're hearing my voice in this demo, maybe somebody might discover me and an opportunity might come. I don't know. I honestly didn't think of it at first until, because I'm like um, very good in person, right? You meet me and I usually leave a lasting impression. Yeah. Like they won't forget me. But if you don't meet me and you just hear me on a track, I wasn't necessarily thinking like, oh, they're going to, who is this girl? Yeah. You know? yeah. So I, no, I didn't really think that. It's, I feel very confident if I meet someone in person, I can sell myself. Mm -hmm. But I think um, on the track, I, I didn't really think anything of it I see. until Taylor said hey man like this could be big what if they you know and he was the one that told me they he's mm. like you sound good what if they want to they might want to keep you on the track and yeah. I was like what and wow. so then that's kind of and it did that's exactly what happened um, and then because so Taylor's manager is the one who actually is connected with Universal who ended up signing me just and we did meet in person uh -huh. and it was because of us meeting when I flew out to Massachusetts to be shooting content with Sam for the song yeah. that he just was like we have to work together and it was it was it was just honestly yeah. another God moment yeah. where he's like I wasn't planning on signing any new artists he goes yeah. but we connected on such a deep level of purpose and knowing like what my what my story and vision is for my music and all of that and how I feel I'm going to be a mouthpiece in this culture and society that mm -hmm. he was like, this is everything I've been praying for yeah. and exactly what, you know, I'm, I've been looking for. So 
it all happened. I had contracts signed within a week. Like it was. Okay. It was, wow. I mean, no, within a few weeks, because I had to get lawyers and stuff. But sure. I mean, it, I'm saying that they were written up within yeah. a week, and then like we kind of, you know, went from there. But. Yeah. Well, that was going to be my next question: was how did this the the success of this song, which sounded like it was pretty immediate, it was pretty quick. How how. Quickly, it people. didn't blow up as much as we wanted to. We wanted millions of streams, you know. Okay. Um, but over, over over platforms, obviously, it was. But yeah. um, mm -hmm. I mean, it like with just Spotify alone, it, it didn't quit, quite hit the numbers that we wanted it to. Uh -huh. But we were able to perform it in front of twenty thousand people um, in Massachusetts. We wow. did a Kiss FM concert. We opened for Charlie Puth for. Um, the oh, chain wow. smokers for really? like all these massive artists. I never even posted it. I'm like so, so oh, bad. Man. I'm like no one even knows that, <laughs> that I did it, you know. But my parents flew out for yeah. it. It was pretty like I was low key about it, but it, it was an experience of a lifetime for sure. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So okay, all, all of that together. Yeah. This song being being published, doing those those openers at at these big shows. Mm -hmm. How did this change the? the track of your music career from that point uh, on until today? Well, basically, I mean, once I had that contract signed after the song ended up being, you know, what it was, um, we started working immediately on what's my next move as an artist and as an individual, you know? So then I went out to LA a bunch and I worked with a lot of different producers to try to find my sound and my, so you know, like what my next, I guess story would be that I'm just gonna tell, you know? Yeah. And so we started working on a rollout for my next few singles and basically a timeline and this is what they promised and you know, I'm gonna, we're gonna get a few albums out by this year and basically everything just started becoming more of a daily like yeah. check-in with my, you know, with my team and like having different people with different roles that help me. I'm not like a one man girl, or, you know, a one man show anymore. It's right. like now I have people that I work with to help me achieve the goals that uh -huh. I have for music. Love it. And, and what year did that song come out again? Um, that that was just last summer. It was last summer, okay. Or last, not, maybe not summer. I think it's, it's it was like more so in the beginning or like spring. For sure. Yeah, within I the don't remember exactly. <laughs> I got you, yeah, within the past year or, or so. Yeah. So that it's very recent. And, and I guess it, it it's showing that more recently is when your music career has really pivoted. Yeah, amped up for sure. I've been in a lot of musicals and I've performed and I have been paid to be in like lead roles and stuff like that. So that has been a part of my career that it wasn't just a hobby. I did actually get paid to okay. do it. So okay. um, though, though that was definitely a part of it. But um, as far as like now doing my own music that I've written uh -huh. and stuff and as an artist, yes. Within the last year, it's really just changed a lot from yeah. just being like, oh, I'm singing and I'm writing to no, I'm actually doing this now. Yeah. Yeah. Who has inspired you throughout your life in within music the most? Is there an artist or somebody you looked up to or really modeled yourself after? You know, funny enough, because I grew up with just somewhat, like, I grew up with old old music. I loved Ella Fitzgerald. Oh, cool. And Frank Sinatra. Those nice. were my two people. And which is so funny because there's it's so, like, you know, 40s. But... I just loved the purity in her voice. I loved the emotion that mm -hmm. she portrayed, um, that her music was pure, and it was very, um, it was heartfelt. It's almost like you could feel her cry. Yeah. You could feel her crying. You could feel her tears. You know, you could feel everything that she felt. Like, she had such a way of portraying that emotion, mm -hmm. um, which I really connected to. And yeah. not to mention, like, she... I don't know. She had obviously style and she was jazzy and she had her own flair. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But um, I also love that she sang about life. She sang about love. She sang about things that she had experienced. And I love that. And then Frank Sinatra is just like, come oh, yeah. on, he's just a legend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So that's amazing. And then when you did your first single, it was called uh, Light This Fire, right? Yeah, that was before I got signed, though. So That was before, okay. Yeah, so they actually had me take it down because after the contract, I mean, they wanted to start with a clean slate. Oh, I see. I mean, to be, you know, they didn't want me to have anything else. So it's still on YouTube, <laughs> yeah. my music video is, um, but as far as it being on all platforms, they Got did. It. it was, like, part of the contract to start fresh with yeah. them. Yeah, okay, I see, because yeah. I was looking for it, and I didn't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense now. Yeah. So you're working on some, some music, and, yes. and you had mentioned this just a little while ago, but you have, what, what can we... What's next with what you're coming out with? 
Okay, well, my next song will literally be out in the next month, and okay. um, July 28th. Awesome. So okay. it is called On Top. On Top. And yeah, it is a. Um, it, that was a cool story how that how that song came about. But I'm very excited. I'm very excited about it. Yeah. Wow. Is there? Do, I mean, I, I'm focusing mostly on music because it sounds like that's your primary focus, right? It is right okay. now. Yes. Cool. Yeah. And is is it fair to say that? The personal training, the the uh, massage company that the stretching massage uh -huh. assisted company that you started, uh, those things were kind of more just to support yourself yes. throughout the years yes. as you were trying to become a, an artist. Yes, absolutely. It was a way that I could you know survive and pay my bills and live in San Diego and yeah. you know all of that and <laughs> <laughs> and travel between here in LA all the time and all of that. So it was able to support my lifestyle and then also it gave me so much freedom of time to be able to really chase after my passion. I have uh -huh. so much I mean I own my time, right? So yeah. being an entrepreneur like nobody tells me when I have to be somewhere. I schedule all my own clients and mm -hmm. work it around the other music things that I have going on. So yeah. it really has given me so much freedom of cre of creativity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. I do just want to ask briefly about the acting you've done. Mm -hmm. So it's been exclusively uh, theater musical productions or have you done any any TV stuff? I've done several commercials, mm -hmm. um, acting commercials and stuff like that, um, but I've never done like a, a, a show or like a movie, you know what yeah. I mean? Nothing like huge. Um, I've done several commercials, TV stuff like that and tutorials and online stuff like that. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Cool. And that's just kind of been a somewhat sporadic throughout throughout the journey? Yeah. That's mm -hmm. been more sporadic. That and modeling have just been, again, other ways to get make money. Yeah. And I am passionate about acting, but I haven't even really dove too much into that because I'm so focused on music right now. Okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, no, that just because you're you've told me that that's why I'm really directing the focus on the music as yeah. I was just saying Well, uh, I'm, I'm so excited <laughs> to hear about what you come out with next as Thank far as you. music Yeah, I, ha I already know the next three so it's yeah. on top okay. the art of letting go and Hollywood dream nice. So those will be my next three songs that I'll be putting out within the next few months. Okay. Yeah. All right guys take <laughs> notes. look out for those <laughs> Yeah, That's awesome if you could share what you think your purposes in pursuing this these goals in being an entertainer being a performer being a musician is there a way that you can describe that do, do you have a strong understanding of what that is yes it's hard to put into like limited words but I would say that I really believe that I'm supposed to be a voice mm -hmm. for this generation and the culture that we're currently living in I think that I want to be a role model and almost like a big sis, you know, to like, I feel called to the youth for sure. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, I feel like they're my people that I, that I want to talk to right? Help them, um, avoid the same mistakes that I made, you mm. know, in my life. And we didn't really touch on like the things that I've been through, but, um, yeah, I've just, I feel like I've overcome actually a lot of things in my life, a yeah. lot of thing, uh, just things I've experienced. And so out of those places, I want to be able to bring raw music that can truly connect to people and heal them. I really believe my music will bring healing. It will bring restoration to mm -hmm. people's like broken hearts and also give them hope and inspiration to continue to chase whatever it is that they feel is their purpose and like what were you made to do like you know that that's i mean if you could do it you know what would you chase after like mm -hmm. i think um yeah and i i really i'm also very much about like empowering women to step into their identity mm -hmm. step into their confidence into their femininity and to really own who they are and not have to compromise with the world standards of oh I have to like sell my body to make it no you don't yeah. you know and I want to be an example of what that looks like mm -hmm. like no I'm not going to sell myself short in that way mm -hmm. like yes you can I don't know I just feel like there are actually several messages that I want to highlight and several several things on my heart that yeah. I want to sing about and you know because music is is so universal and really it crosses all cult cultural boundaries yeah and and it can it just speaks so loudly that people people will receive it they won't receive it from a pulpit they won't receive it from you know dip certain but they will receive it in a song yeah and so I feel like um I really just yeah I want to be a voice I want to I have a lot to say yeah. <laughs> on a lot of different topics okay so the way you started to answer that question it, it made me realize 
you know, you, you said we haven't really talked about some of the things you've overcome. I think I got so intrigued by your story when you were doing your 12-month experience yeah. and the hardships you experienced there, the spiritual battle, spiritual battle that you experienced. Uh, what are you able to share as far as some really key tough things that you've overcome in your life? I don't know if this was at some point in your childhood or, or at some point in your adult life after, uh, not including this trip that we spent some time talking about. Mm -hmm. What would you point to to relate to how you just answered that question in terms of why you want to be this voice? Well, I would say that, um, I mean, growing up, I actually did grow up with quite a bit of bullying and um, mm. like teasing and all that kind of thing um, that did affect me because it, it actually carried on way past, you know, because I believed the things that people would say about me. And um, it very early on, I was teased and bullied about being very small. I was like very very skinny really um, we grew up vegan in the beginning of our lives or vegetarian vegetarian yeah. um, for like the first 10 years uh -huh. I was like a foot shorter than everyone else in my grade and still until we started eating like animal products we literally were so little uh -huh. um, and also our family was just our genetics we were all very thin uh -huh. so but I mean because of that being like I ended up uh, getting an eating disorder quite early on mm. um, and I mean very young like I, I would start just eating as much as I could to try to just fit in. I just didn't want to be teased, you know? Yeah. I mean, my own, like, it was sad, but even my own church leaders, you know, would actually poke fun in front of the entire church and, like, say things that really wounded me at a young age because I was so impressionable. I think I was, like, preteen, like, 12, 13, you know, when I'm just, like... Yeah, and they, they would. Yeah. I, I remember one of my leaders literally in front of all my peers saying, turn around, like, show people, you know, no what you look like, my body. <laughs> and then she'd laugh at me and she was like there's nothing there oh like and gosh. literally just saying that I was like a walking stick you know yeah. but I mean that like you have no idea what that did at such a young age um, and especially that puberty you know that whole time yeah. of my life so I would overeat 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 and and try to like get big and, and mm. then I would get sick and then so it was like this whole thing and then that turned into I actually got too big later on because I started eating <laughs> so I had set you know I, wow. I stretched out my stomach so much then when I tried to just eat normal, I had this whole binging and purging situation going on. Oh. So then I was trying to get skinny again. And then I was just throwing everything up. And then I just, I was so unhealthy, you know, that all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So I struggled with that for most of my life. Um, wow. The whole eating disorder. And then because of that, I think I, I, I had some insecurities, you know, right? I uh -huh. had some insecurities. Like, um, and that insecurity led me to abusive relationships. So mm. then dealing with that, um, not only verbally, but even physically abusive and getting out of those situations and having to tell yourself like you're worth more than this, you know, mm -hmm. you don't deserve this kind of treatment. And, um, you know, the relationship with my dad growing up wasn't terrible, but it wasn't wonderful either. And so that also, I kind of realized later in life kind of, uh, I think influenced my choices in men. Mm. and my choices in relationships and how I, you know, that kind of thing. And so, yeah, there, there's like a lot of things that all connect, but yeah. um, there are um, among other things, but I would say those are some of the highlights, you know? Yeah, well, that, those are important pieces and I'm thank you again for sharing that. Yeah. That's, so throughout that time when you're experiencing the issues with eating and, and so forth and, and the maybe the self-image in the preteen years and throughout you were still always active, right? This was throughout the time we talked oh, about. Oh, very. Yeah, I worked very... out every day of my life. You know, uh -huh. it had nothing to do with that. It's just my eating was so, like, my relationship with food was very unhealthy. Yeah. Yeah. When did you think you got over got over that? Because obviously you're, you're extremely knowledgeable about diet and, yeah. and fitness and, and eating right. Yeah. I mean, we just talked about how you were doing this carnivore carnivore diet, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is wildly different from kind of how things were back then, how yeah. you just described it. Yeah. Like, how, how'd you get past that? Like, because the insecurity, I can see how that fuels so many other areas in, in relationships or with men, whether it's a family or, or, yeah. or partners. I can see that. And I, I feel like a lot of people as well who are really focused on having a good body or who are in shape. Uh, I, I do think a lot of people maybe share an experience like this to yeah. some degree. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So many right? people. A lot of bodybuilders. Yeah. There's like a body, what's the word? Is it dysmorphia? Yes, that's yeah. exactly what I had. I would look in the mirror and I would like 
pinch this much and I would be like I'm you know like yeah, yeah you just get it, it gets really unhealthy <laughs> uh -huh. so how'd you well, when would you say you got past that or, or how did you because maybe it's not I assume it's not one moment in time you know it kind of was actually mm. I was in a a pretty toxic relationship um, when I was living in LA during the pandemic and I I finally, I, I don't know, during the pandemic, I was like, you know what, I'm, I'm going to stop this. Like, I'm just going to um, start fasting and I'm just going to lose whatever weight I have that I don't want to have anymore. I'm just going to discipline myself. I just made a deal with myself. I actually ate one meal a day for a month. And I mean like one small meal a day oh, wow. for a month. And I said, now I'm never going to struggle with this again. Food will not, no longer own me. It's almost like I just made a decision. I said, um, it will no longer control me. You know, I'm mm. not going to be fueled by my desire to eat. Like, because I would have this weird, like, I would, you know, just this real whole thing yeah. was all off. And so I just said, no, I'm going to eat to live and I'm going to eat to be healthy. And I'm going to, you know, I just started changing my mindset. And I, I always worked out, like I said, but it wasn't that it was the food thing. And so mm -hmm. I just decided for that month, I lost like 20 pounds and I never, it never came back. Like, and wow. so I, and it's funny because I was never like fat. Because I always had a lot of muscle. I actually used to lift a lot heavier and, uh, like, be bigger and more built. Yeah. Um, but I definitely was not at my ideal weight, you know? Like, I had extra. And so mm -hmm. now I feel like I'm exactly the way my body was supposed to be. I'm petite mm -hmm. in general. I'm, like, a smaller build, so I shouldn't have been that big. Mm -hmm. um, and that was just because I overate, you know? I just yeah. wasn't healthy. Um, was this fuel? I mean, it, it was fueled by your your recognition for these bad patterns with with eating and, and stuff, and the relationship with food. But was there something else from uh, the, you said the relationship you're in uh, that you're able to share had an impact on this? I change? knew I was gonna leave him, like, and I was like, and I'm just gonna be the best version of me. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, I did. I mean, I I broke up with him. I. I just, I kind of just did a refresh on my whole life, you know? Yeah. I was like, I'm going to be the best version of me in every area, and I'm going to cut off this toxicity, and I'm going to, you know, be my best self. And so I kind of just made all of those choices within, yeah, I think just all that self-reflection, being locked up away for, <laughs> yeah. you know, however all long us, it right? was. Jeez. I mean, L.A. was the worst, like, oh, as far yeah. as, like, we weren't allowed to leave our houses. Yeah. And so for a, a whole solid month, I'm like, all right, that's this is what I'm going to do. Yeah. And right. that was my focus, and I did it, so... Then I broke up, came to San Diego. The pandemic was a breeze after that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, was, I, I moved from San Francisco during that time as well, so yeah. I, I can relate to that. Yeah. Wow, so much growth, Jasmine, throughout this journey. I'm, it's, I, we kind of jumped around a little bit, yeah. but I, I'm feeling like we're, we're bringing it together with where you are today and, and what made you who you are today, uh, where you come from. So I, I'm appreciative that you shared these experiences, the, the good and the bad. Uh, I do have a couple kind of fun questions to end it, but I just want to give you the opportunity to share. Is there anything else from your life journey that we missed that you want to share with, with the audience? Uh, not off the top of my head. I okay. think we covered a lot. We covered a lot. We yeah. covered a lot. I mean, of course, there are more stories to be told, sure. but not like not a huge thing. I think that needs to be yeah. right. Okay. Well, one question I like to ask everybody to at the end of the show, mm -hmm. is, since this is an entrepreneurial focused podcast, right? I know we we talked about your music career. You, you've done some. You, you, you've been entrepreneurial throughout your life. Yeah. And that's the that's my show is. I, I specifically say in the description, hey, I'm going to interview people who are artists, musicians, athletes, entrepreneurs, business people, just people with that mindset. So this this mindset and what you do to progress in your life it can be unique to you in whatever you do. Mm -hmm. So if you could think of some sort of entrepreneurial life hack that is unique to you in your journey that perhaps is against the mainstream belief not like a common one right mm -hmm. uh, is there anything you have in mind that you would share for that yeah well i think contrary to to the belief um that you have that you're more productive if you wake up at you know before anyone else wakes up i would almost flip that i do agree with that because i do i actually do wake up at 5 a.m okay. most days but um 
for the days where you want to be extra creative as a creative and as an artist i am a most creative in those midnight past midnight hours mm. so i would say if you flip that and if you say you're awake past when everyone else is asleep mm -hmm. it almost can work for you on the flip side where yeah. the world is sleeping and everything is silent and you're not thinking of anything about what you have to do later or like what's coming up or the events but you're literally just soaking in that moment Mm -hmm. you're able to be so creative and really dive deep into like what you're feeling and how you, what you're thinking and you don't have all those distractions that the day will bring you know yeah so um i think that it can work also like i said at night and you can get extremely creative even with business ideas and plans i mean i really get so much done in those late hours when yeah. everyone in, when the world is sleeping so i think that is contrary because they always say yeah. go to bed you know you're go right. to bed early wake up early but hey, I mean, there is something to be said about those late hours that really you can just get those creativity flows that you yeah. can't get in the morning, you know? I love it. That's a good one. <laughs> cool. Uh, is there anyone who you have in mind in your network or beyond that you think I should have on this show given the type of profile I'm looking for? People like you, people who are up to some cool things and entrepreneurial, building something. Yeah, I actually think... Um, Montez Blair would be a great person to connect with. Okay. He is um, got quite a repertoire and is working on a lot of things. He's an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. um, he was an Olympic athlete. Mm. Um, just he has an amazing story, uh -huh. life story. Um, and yeah, I don't know. Just has a lot to to offer wisdom and yeah. you know stuff like that. I think he'd be a great connection. Perfect. Well, I'll follow up with you on getting connected with Montez. All right. Great. Awesome, Jasmine. Well, why don't you share your social media so people can find you and how can they get to know who you are and, and listen to your music? Yes. Yeah, so on all my platforms, it is uh, Jasmine Nicolay. So mm -hmm. it is uh, at J-A-Z-M-I-N-I-K-O-L-E. Mm -hmm. All okay. one word. <laughs> Got it. So the N is combined with yes, the last name. Yes, it's all combined. One it's N. all one. And that's literally on every every platform. That is my name, even my email. So <laughs> Nice. I yeah, love it. That's the best way. Well, Jasmine, thanks so much for being on the show. This has been an awesome conversation. So good to get to know you better and, and what you've been through and what's next. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's been such an honor. Absolutely. Well, I'm <laughs> excited to see how everyone responds. So. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Jasmine. You're welcome. Okay. Bye, All everybody. Right. Bye. Slow down now. I just don't know how. Thank you for joining our conversation today on the Nickels and Dimes show. Please check out and follow my podcast, Instagram at Nickels and Dimes show. I'd love to have you subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or YouTube. You can also find it on my website. I welcome and encourage any feedback you can share in the reviews so I can continue to improve and develop the show. Thanks again and see you next time.